throughout your life as a pianist um, playing what I would argue is less chords, less voicings. You still play voicings, of course, but would it be fair to say that you play less less of that than than uh, than before? And uh, t tell me about that process and how how you got there and what you did to get there. Okay. Um, well, you just explained it. <laughs> no, I mean, um, counterpoint. I mean, for me, for me um, I think st studying classical music made me realise that certainly the kind of classical music that I liked wasn't based on static harmonic progressions, um, meaning chords that go from one to the other and then you kind of hang the melody off it. Mm -hmm. um, it was more to do, I mean, counterpoint, I, re I remember I had a bit of a Glenn Gould phase and I remember him talking, an interview with him where he, he said, I'm not interested in music that isn't contrapuntal. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I, I think I started looking at music that I already liked and thought, is this contrapuntal? Why do I like it? Because I have to like everything that Glenn Gould to like. <laughs> Did likes. you find any music that you liked that wasn't contrapuntal? Um, yeah, actually, that I can't. I can't remember. I mean, I think all music is contrapuntal to a degree, um, and I think it's more. It's more that if you get too involved in the harmony, you, you ignore the counterpoint that is actually going on. Mm -hmm. Like with Herbie Hancock, it's like people always want to know what his voicings are, and they ask me, I've got no idea whatsoever, but I can, I can approximate something, you know. And then you want to say, yeah, but that's not the point. Yeah, you yeah. know, like, listen to what he's doing between the hands. Mm -hmm. Um, and for me, it was like listening to that and listening to Glenn Gould playing the Goldberg variations and listening to Fela Kuti and listening to Stravinsky, like all these things kind of drew together. And then when I heard Bill Frizzell, mm -hmm. in some way he was doing that as well. Yeah. He definitely. was already doing it kind of thing. In a sort of super um, reduced. But way. I did, you know, that's. That, that's a kind of way of thinking about it but but actually I, I did also spend a lot of time in my 20s practicing the Goldberg variations and living off God knows what I think I signed on for a bit um, did a tiny little bits of teaching but mm. but I kind of obsessively practiced it and mm. that just seeped in to everything yeah you know so so part of it was just whatever you put in eventually will come out you know? mm -hmm. and so there was no kind of specific like deliberate um, improvising practice rather than playing written music like Bach uh, regarding mm. how to na navigate the chords of because we tonight uh, we played you know lots of different types of music lots of different styles and uh, the cool thing is that um and this is a compliment that you know you you play the same way in each tune essentially you yeah know? Uh, and that's yeah. a huge compliment actually because if you you know if it's if each tune sounds like a different person then you have no identity blah 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 um how, how how did you manage to apply that thing to like any piece of music um well i think i mean i say this a lot to students it's like one way or the other you're going to have to repeat things a lot of times before they become part of your reflex like mm -hmm. when somebody says g7 mm -hmm. you know for a while you play g and then you think where's the seventh there's the seventh and then after a while you think oh i can play the ninth mm -hmm. you know and so your reflex becomes and now my reflex is to go like that yeah but it's the same reflex. Yeah. It's just that I've done that a lot. And I, I mean, I've always been really bad at exercises. Mm -hmm. Like, so going around the cycle of things in all keys 
I was terrible at that. So I, I just used to play the same tunes a lot. And mm -hmm. then if I thought, okay, F sharp is not going very well, um, I'd find a tune in F sharp. Yeah. Because also the other thing about the other thing about growing up playing classical music and then studying it was, you know, A flat major is not the same as A major. Mm -hmm. If you imagine all Beethoven's slow movements being in A instead of A flat, or the classic thing for me was uh, Bill Evans playing My Foolish Heart, mm. and in the real book it's in B flat, and it's somehow such a plain key B flat but on yeah on the record it's in A ah okay and the first thing that happens he plays that chord and Scott LaFaro plays a big open string as yeah, a bass yeah, player yeah. well I it's, yeah I appreciate those sharp keys massively as, yeah. a, as a string player so do you have a, a specific personalised relationship with different keys like like they did you know, for most of history, <laughs> until yeah. until it kind of became standardised and all keys are equal. Do you associate certain emotions or certain moods or whatever with B flat or A or G flat, which is my favourite key, for example? I, I mean, I do. So I'm wondering if you yeah, do. Yeah, I I think I. It's not so much that, but I remember pieces of music. There are certain sonorities that I think, ah, oh, that's that. Like mm. I know I don't have perfect pitch. But I know when I hear C major because I spent ages going <laughs> badly, <laughs> you know. Sounded great. So, so, and do you think that thing of keys is 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 to do with association? Um, do, like, you know, is it? I think some things are just, some things are some things acquire meaning because the key becomes important. So, like, yeah. You know, as a teenager, when I used to practice that. Beethoven Sonata, it it acquires some other meaning because the whole thing resonates in a certain way, mm -hmm. um, and it's part of the information going in to your brain. So you yeah. you can't, in contrast to for me doing playing the same licks in every key, mm. you sort of neutralise the key somehow. I completely identify with that and I know I know that some people I know saxophone players feel like they have to work like that because the, 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 the kind of mechanics of hearing the music and feeling the music are different because they're floating yeah in a different in a in a most peculiar way <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know but for me personally I mean you just eventually you just find a way to get things done and if if somebody is telling you that this is the only way you're going to do this mm. and you can't do it but you love the music mm -hmm. then you have to tell them to sling their hook and of do course. it a different way you know? yeah that co that voicing you played that g that g7 voicing you played uh, which you know is, has the same function as g major yeah uh but is spread out and and um, I think one of the things that uh, makes your, your sound really identifiable and, and distinctive, I suspect it comes down to a lot of things that you've rejected rather than a lot of things that you choose to do. Yeah. So if I think about all the people who have incredibly identifiable sounds, um, they've just focused, they've boiled it down to something really really focused and I, I would say that's true about you too so what are the things that you've rejected along the way what are the things that you refuse to do they could be like could be repertoire could be specific harmony could be like melodies or types of melodies or anything at all anything at all that you just won't won't do anymore um i would never say never that's the first thing yeah um sometimes it's just it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing. Is it, do people not call you for it or do you just give off the signs that you don't want to do it? So like, stuff like Joe Henderson tunes. Like I love Joe Henderson. Yeah. And Joe Henderson playing Joe Henderson tunes sounds great and Herbie playing Joe Henderson tunes sounds great but I just can't find a way to deal with inner urge. Yeah. For instance. And I used to, I used to be able to. Yeah. 
but now I feel like it's not even for me it's not even really a value it was definitely not a value judgment no. but it's just my instinct is to look for something like what's in green chimneys or what's in um, some of those folk tunes do you think there's, so there's something about uh, the content being simple is yeah, there something about yeah. that I think I think um, I think inner urge is a great chord sequence with a basically a sort of an improvised line over the top as a as a melody mm -hmm. um, and I can't f I can't find anything that I can use in it yeah but that's that's just because I'm not used to looking there in a way mm -hmm. you know I think one day when I've got loads of time to practice people like Joe Henderson Woody Shaw that whole thing of different pentatonics scales yeah, yeah. and different you know all the, all of, all of these things are just sounds that it will probably be led by me having to do a gig where I go for something I think I don't have anything yeah yeah you know um, I mean like I play in Julian Siegel's band there are times in that band where I think I don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do in that moment? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think of something I, 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 I think I just have to work extra hard to not panic yeah. and play less. Okay. You know, so if I'm like, if I'm going to, I mean, of course you never say never because the context sometimes will, will, yeah just ask you to play something that you'd normally never play but just play me something go on just just see if we, just try and play me something that you hate and you'd never play <laughs> i know that's really uh, difficult and putting you on the spot but yeah. there must be there must be something like for example something because the other day you were talking about keith jarrett's kind of um i mean we love keith jarrett right mm. he's amazing he's a genius for sure but um you know like the most sentimental Keith Jarrett, just playing yeah. play me oh, something like well, that. Well, okay, the melody in the night with you, you know that yeah, record? Yeah. I just none of it. I, maybe if I went back to it now, but at the time, I just thought, no, this is this is kind of syrupy, and it's 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 got the, the edge has been taken out. Okay. Um, and yeah. there are some people I like, like. Lyle Mays mm -hmm. with Pat Metheny, but but that's like, no way I'm going anywhere near that okay, okay. stuff. Okay. You know, Why Winston Kelly. Now they're all coming out. You see, yeah. Winston, Winston Kelly, Kelly, I love, but I just can't do that trippy <laughs> thing that he does. Yeah. Um, and loads of my students used yeah. to bring transcriptions. They play it and they play these things perfectly, and they say, "Oh, is it all right?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah." Sounds yeah. great. I can't do yeah. that. Yeah. So. Okay, so I mean, I know, I know, I could, I could force you into it if I, if I persisted, but yeah. I, I, I know it's hard to, to just play something you hate, because, yeah, it's hard because because you're, probably, <laughs> probably, you're probably thinking there's probably a time where I would actually do this, and I, I understand yeah. that, but um, but I still maintain that um, there are lots of things that you definitely don't do. Um, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And that I would argue there are a lot more things that you don't do than most people don't do. Yeah, um, pretty much everything that Chick Corea has ever played. Right. And I went through I went through doing La Fiesta in Spain and all that those kind of things just yeah. when I came out of college and really loved it. Yeah, um, but the thing is for the people who don't know what um, what those, you know, for the, for the lay people who don't know what Chick Corea is, just, just give us an example of what that is. And we're not having to go at Chick Corea because yeah, he's obviously yeah, amazing. Yeah, I, it's I just that personal, he... the personal thing of what you decide to reject in in forging your musical identity. Uh, okay, so like, let's pick a tune like in a sentimental mood. Yeah. I would never go. I would never. I know you were talking about baroque ornamentation. Yeah. Earlier today, but that's. I think uh, yeah. I would just never do that because that says something like this yeah that I don't I mean you've I just, do it you just nailed it you just nailed my what I wanted so I'm gonna gonna go on because that's
What is the relationship between irony and cheese in music? Whatever the difference is, it's either side of a pretty fine line. Sure. You know? And you get the sense that if you took out, if you just uh, notated what he plays and, and took out all all the inflection, all the all the Bill Frizzell from it, and just, just wrote down the notes and then got someone else to play them or got a computer to play them, mm. it might sound really, really awful. Um, yeah. Not always, but sometimes. And that's the bit that's hard to understand, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's like Johnny Hodges, isn't it? It's like the... the the notes, for me, that 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 area of improvising, the notes kind of get swallowed up by the sound. Yeah. So it's not like, here are the notes, here here is somebody's sound delivering you the notes. It's more like here is a person. Yeah. Playing, making sounds, and here are the here are the notes that they're using so they fit in with everybody else. But they've got to. People have to fit together, but yeah. it, but it's like with all that Ellington stuff, that Ellington horn section, they're all pulling at each other. Mm. I, t I transcribed something the other day. I was just trying to get a tune down for my solo gig, and I, <laughs> I, I looped a bit and was just transcribing it to try and get the chords. Yeah. I thought, wow, they're so out of tune. Mm. Ellington's band, God, they're so out of tune. It's painful. Mm -hmm. But only when you listen to it on a loop yeah, when yeah. you listen to the whole thing the tuning just kind of moves around moves yeah, yeah. you know that's what's so brilliant about yeah yeah so would you say that um the irony we can call it irony or we can just mm. call it nothing i mean the the i mean it's, it's definitely like a, a sense of humor or a kind of dryness or a, a, i don't know what it is but would you just simply say that that's just a reflection of when you play um, music and it makes someone laugh, like sometimes it makes me laugh yeah. what you play, you know, and yeah. again, that's a massive compliment. I hope you yeah. take it in that way. Um, would you just say that's just a reflection of your personality and no more? It's not like you're deliberately thinking about how to, how to, how to, how to connect, like playing, um, you know, a, yeah. a cheesy ornament in an ironic way so that it becomes cool yeah I mean that's a that's a big question I mean I, I think I think I, I have a, a tendency as a person as well as a musician to, to want to deliver things in a kind of un ornamented way somehow mm-hmm um, like I had this I've had loads of discussions with people before in music about you know being successful by asking people for success you know like going to people and saying I am doing this and it's really good can you and I need some help and you probably will want to help me because I'm very good mm -hmm. and to me there's, some, there's something about that that I can't do Mm -hmm. And in some way, it feels related to the way that I play. Right. Like, I, I don't want to make something sound more pretty than it is. Okay, okay. But at the same time... But you might want to make it... Sorry, I didn't interrupt. You might yeah. want to sound, make it sound... Replace the word pretty with something else, and that might be tr true now. Yeah, yeah. I mean... I, I think... I think a lot of this was just was just hearing Monk for that first time and hearing how he how he sort of and Miles Davis as well actually mm. that was a very important point yeah that they they play and then they stop and you're waiting for them to do something mm. and then when when they do it quite often it's it's funny and you do laugh yeah you know but laughing isn't like people laugh at all kinds of stuff and most of the time it's not it's not because the material itself is funny it's because they've been surprised by something yeah so like i've laughed at jokes that you know i wouldn't want to say on facebook that i'd laughed at those jokes but it's like 
somebody was telling it and it just jumped that punchline just jumped out it's like god that's terrible you know yeah, you're yeah, laughing yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because of the surprise have you got any good jokes that you can tell no. you can tell on facebook no all right I've got, i'm pretty bad at remembering jokes <laughs> me too okay fair enough all right i'm gonna i'm gonna keep keep going then um because that's i mean actually before i do that just just tell me about monk just tell me a little bit more about monk if, if there's anything you want to mm. add about that because um because yeah like you've been pretty deep into his music i would have thought and uh, well, it certainly sounds like it yeah and you've managed to find a way which is so difficult to play his music um uh, in, in a way that doesn't kind of miss the point of the music doesn't miss the identity but at the same time doesn't just copy what he plays completely you know the spirit you've kind of managed to find the spirit of the music and a certain amount of the actual harmonic content which is like fundamental to making it sound mm. like the compositions he wrote so is there anything else you wanted to say about about monk well actually it's funny when i when i think about the first monk that i heard a lot of it was the solo yeah. stuff it just happened to be like that on this record that i had and i remember there was a, a solo version of little rooty tooty and he he it's stride piano and yeah. stride piano was my way into jazz okay and also the thing about stride piano is i mean i could never do it like properly but sort of stride stroke ragtime you realize when when you get the feel between your hands right suddenly it, it kind of comes to life yeah yeah it's it sits basically yeah it's like you're 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 working in a kind of a rhythm section sure. thing and monk i think monk just had had that massively his mm. his stripped down kind of stride thing and i'm in some ways i'm always thinking of that mm. you know that's the link to the source the same with ellington mm. ellington came through that style basie came through um and it, it's it's about an attack and a sound and basically all the people that I liked like Ellington he just had improvised voicings he used the same voicings quite a lot but he also occasionally would just go for weird sounds yeah. and you could tell it was just the sound mm -hmm. and the attack yeah yeah and you can feel how the drums respond to it and I, just, I always just thought that's what I want to do I don't want to be like burning and have somebody ticking around on the top of me I want to be like up to my knees in shit of the music you know yeah that's that's great and and I remember that um I remember because I because you gave me my first ever jazz piano lesson in my life right when I was 17 did in, I, Birmingham. in Birmingham yeah. yeah and that was and in that lesson there are a few things I remember from that lesson and and some of those things have, you know I remember them because they were great and they stayed with me um one of them was you said something like, I love Duke Ellington because when he plays a low fifth on the piano, you just know straight away that it's him. So just play as a low fifth so, we, so everyone knows what we're talking about. Exactly. So, you know, if I played that low fifth, it wouldn't sound anything like Duke Ellington. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying you sound like Duke yeah. Ellington either, but t tell me about this thing of piano sound and, yeah, just talk to me about piano sound because that's a super interesting area. Yeah. Well, you can, pre you can, I don't know. I mean, I know you can make a really good sound on the piano. <laughs> yeah, but I might not be able to make so, that sound. No. And that's, that's the sound that's more to do with jazz. Yeah. Probably. I think, I, I think the key for me is that there are, there are simple sounding things that are complicated. Yeah. You know, um, and people like Monk and Ellington, I think, I've heard people say that, that Ellington can't play the piano. I've heard people say, obviously, that Monk can't play the piano. But they, they refined the sound of what they did. So when you look at a transcription of Ellington, you know, it might go... Or something. Yeah. You know, I, I still have no idea really what he's doing, but the, the, he, he has this thing of it darting all around. Mm. But 
but these you know you have to have those grace notes yeah if you go no it doesn't you know it's not like that but then if you play them both at the same time that's too much yeah so yeah so you can spend quite a lot of time just kind of as if you were trying to mimic somebody's accent you know like if you're trying to do the difference between a Newcastle accent and a Sunderland accent or something. Can you do that? No. <laughs> nowhere Shit. near. Damn it. That nowhere be, near. That would be a massively great addition to but, this. But it's like that detail, you know. Yeah, of course, of course. The detail of, of attack, isn't it? Yeah. And articulation. Do you think sound is the most important thing in music? Yeah, I think so. And do you think... Uh, it's taught that way. Do you think music is taught that way? Do you think we're encouraged to, to worry about sound as much as as much as we should, or um, do you think other things are prioritised? Well, I don't know. I can't really speak for a lot of other teachers. I mean, I I I feel like um, you know there are some teach. There are some people that play and they have a great sound, but it's not something they think about because maybe they, maybe they worked really hard and methodically about getting a harmonic language together, and so they know how to impart that knowledge because it's something that you can work hard at, um, and you can you can sort of replicate that in somebody else in some way. Yeah. And but for me, but for me, it is the most important thing, and I do try and do and put that across for the same reason you know that yeah. I, it's something that i worked really hard at doing because i had to get from classical to jazz yeah and it's a profound for me it's a profound difference in the sound you know. yeah in what 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 sound serves the music yeah okay yeah so is there would you say it has has this got something to do with um dryness in music dryness being the opposite of um of reverb of uh, resonance of echo um, so this is to do with uh, well it could be to do with like how much reverb you put on your recordings but it's also to do with how much sustain pedal you use when mm. you play which compared to most piano players I would argue is less you know, yeah I'm generalizing massively but you definitely play quite dry yeah. you know which is um, distinctive yeah I think that's a that's another Glenn Gould thing actually okay I, I, and I noticed that he, he was able to get a difference between voicing bef between voices in a texture by c kind of almost hammering things out in quite a rude sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, that appealed to me because it sounded like jazz. It sounded like three different people in a room playing one piece of music and there would be like inappropriate counterpoint I suppose you would call it like somebody yeah. comes crashing in with a thing yeah, yeah. like Mingus yeah but it's like that's great because he's crashing in yeah it's, it's not it's respectful disruptive. yeah yeah at the same time Keith Jarrett can play very uh respectful counterpoint that's surprising because he's got a whole brain that can go into very disciplined harmonic areas and he knows his shit about it you know, yeah. mm -hmm. but I like that. Yeah, I like that collision. Okay. Sound is the most important thing for you in music. I would definitely mm. say that for me as well. But um, what about like individuality? So there are a lot of, you know, there are music, jazz musicians, any kind of musicians who have really distinct personalities. And we've spoken about why that might be. Maybe they like take loads of stuff out rather than add loads of stuff. Um, those people, do you value that individuality, that kind of weirdness above, in general, above um, other things that maybe we're taught to to really celebrate? For example, like just, um, for example, like encyclopedic knowledge of melod jazz melodic language uh, or digital virtuosity, stuff like mm. that. Is that something, because you seem to play with people who <laughs> are quite... Colourful <laughs> or quirky or yeah, how yeah. do you want to describe it? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I 
yeah but some people make that work and some people don't mm -hmm. for me um i think i mean i certainly would say that individuality is something that you can't you can't really aim for it i think mm. you just one day you look back at things you've done mm -hmm. and you think oh actually that that thing and that thing are both quite good and they're, they're both quite similar and people are saying to me that i'm individual mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's 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 something that that is kind of for me it's something that's sort of decided by other people by consensus like i don't yeah. really I can I can carbon date all the stuff that I've nicked from different people. Sure. And I mean I have I have tried to nick things from a lot of different places and put them together in Strange a way that's different. Strange places maybe. Yes. Yeah, or people that are not that famous Exactly, or, yeah. Um and I think I mean I was even as far back as the 80s I think I think I was thinking everything has kind of been done now mm. in its purer sort of form if jazz was ever a pure form which i doubt mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> i think you know the on the only way to feel like you are contributing something beyond just doing something that makes you feel good mm -hmm. and maybe that's enough that's another debate i suppose but but the only way to to feel that is to assemble the huge amount of stuff and the huge amount of choice even in the 80s there was loads of choice mm. now it's just yeah. ridiculous yeah you know so there's no excuse really to mm. not to not come up with something <laughs> you know <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff out there just look further afield you know okay um tell me about um how you remove things from your piano playing to make them more interesting or specifically more dissonant okay so um or if you don't want to be specific then you could speak about that more generally because i suspect both both versions have an answer yeah i mean it it's it's how I was reminded about this thinking the other day when I, I heard somebody saying to somebody, you've got to think outside the box, you know, which is the most inside the box thing you can say to anybody. And, and I was thinking, what, what would be a really witty response mm. to that? And I thought, well, well, not witty, but like kind of intelligent, <laughs> something. <laughs> I'm grasping at straws. You know. go, go on, tell us. But I think, I think like look a bit more carefully at what is inside the box before you go out of it you know yeah um and then there's a thing about harmony where if you have a g7 chord then you think okay that's too boring we'll have that that's too boring we'll have that there's not enough in it we'll have that you know we can also have that one two three four five six seven so then you've got got every note of a scale um, so you get these chords like that but you don't hear like if you do like if you have eight people in a room all telling rude jokes <laughs> you don't get offended because you don't hear any one of them enough to you know so, so this is the eight people in a room but if you took a lot of it out That's a lot more brutal, and also it sounds better when you go. Sure. To me, that's, I mean, that's just the sound that that I like. Yeah. If I was Fred Hirsch, I would like something else, or if I was, you know. Sure, sure, sure. But and it's also true that that type of harmony, you know, it's not like it's new. It's it's already the I'm talking about the dense harmony. Yeah. It's already been around for, you know, 150 years more or less. Yeah, um, yeah. So I've heard a lot of people who don't 
like jazz or don't listen mm. to jazz. Maybe they don't know they, whether they like jazz or not, but they don't listen to it and they're, and they're not musicians. I heard a lot of people say the same thing, that they find jazz stressful. Yeah. Um, stress is a thing that people associate with jazz. And actually, yeah. to be honest, I associate stress with um, some types of jazz. Not so much playing it, just I always have a good time playing it, but listening to it, I find it stressful sometimes. Um, definitely not listening to you play. Uh, it's stressful, nor is it listening, it's stressful listening to all the people we've spoken about tonight. But is there anything you want to say about that? Well, another story from when I was younger and I was getting into Scott Joplin, Jelly Roll Morton, Fat Swallow, Duke Ellington. Uh, that was all great. I loved all of that. It was all full of space and it grooved and it was very clear what was going on. Yeah. And I remember a lot of this stuff was my dad's records and he had a record, Cannibal Adderley, live at the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. I remember putting that record on uh, and I don't know if you know that record, but it starts with a tune called Saka Wo and it's like... <laughs> it's like real sort of, yeah. you know, groove. They play the head it's like a blues and then they go and then they go into the walking thing yeah yeah and i remember thinking what the fuck yeah yeah what just happened everybody's just now everyone's playing at the same time all the things that everybody thinks yeah about jazz it's all people playing at the same time i can't hear what's going on i can't hear where the time is i can't hear where the chords are there's no tune everyone's playing too fast mm -hmm. um now i listen to that record and it's like can't believe anyone wouldn't find it accessible but i still know you know i can still remember that feeling sure. when i put it on um and i think it's in some in some ways when i listen to jazz records i'm kind of translating it into a live thing you know i'm i'm, I'm i'll put on like Miles Davis at the cellar door with Keith Jarrett, those records, and yeah. it's like, it's it's a racket, yeah, you know. But I, I somehow I can project into my head what it would be like at the gig, and I listen to it like that. Yeah, and it's totally yeah. exhilarating. Yeah, and you know, partly, I mean, the last album I did with um, Seb Brochford and Tom Herbert, where I was using electronics. I tried to not make it that kind of record. I wanted it to be a record that you could put on that draws you in. Yeah. You know, so again, like you say, there's there's stuff you throw out. Sure. You know, and yeah. I played keyboards and piano at the same time, which which made it more difficult for me to get around. So yeah, yeah. there was a lot more space in it, mm. and some of it wasn't intentional. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some, some of it was just me thinking, Shit, if I turn that on, it, it, and it was all live, <laughs> sure, people sure. say, well, how did you do all those overdubs? It's like, yeah. what overdubs? Yeah, yeah. Just... Do you think there's something about um, making, do you think we don't do enough of this in jazz, and this being making what we improvise really, really connected to the composition? So, so avoiding that thing of playing a piece of, playing a, a melody, which has a really identifiable character and it's not like walking swing, you mm. know, um, whatever it is. And then suddenly just completely abandoning it and just defaulting to a sort of standardized way of, of improvising. That's what you describe with that cannibal Adley thing, right? Even though you now yeah. you really like it. Yeah. But it, that's what it is, right? They don't, they kind of throw out the whole groove thing, that type of groove when they're improvising, they don't use it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I right. think that happens all the time and I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, I guess they were sort of flirting with that groove in a way that Cannibal Adderley later on grasped it a bit. Yeah, more. yeah. But for example, in, in your tune that we played earlier today, uh, not your tune, your arrangement of the tune from Oliver, Who Will yeah. Buy. So you have this um, riff that you play. Um, just just play the riff, you know, the, the uh, right hand bit. Yeah. That right hand bit, and then and you play, and then the tune happens on top of that, and it's got a yeah. really clear identity, and you know that the groove is slightly slightly ambiguous. You know, it takes you a while to figure out what it is, and then but you enjoy that ambiguity because the melody is really simple on top, mm. and it sort of floats on top, but in a really clear 
clear way that kind of grounds you. And then when you start to improvise, that it it all suddenly sort of stops, doesn't it? Yeah. And is that something that you like, or is that something that you did on purpose, or is that something that just happens as a result of just the na- the sort of ex- accepted rules of how you play jazz? I don't, I don't know I, what that is. I think at the time, at the time I liked it, but I felt like it was a bit of a weak spot right. in the tune. I couldn't, I couldn't. I mean, I, I, at the time I was listening to like this guy Wayne Horvitz. Yeah, yeah. And he's, you know, he's he's sort of a jazz pianist, but he's not really. He's kind of an improvising, free improvising, rock, funk kind of. Pl- he's yeah. Been in on a lot of scenes, but he, you would never transcribe a solo of his, particularly, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and his his music wasn't really designed for jazz musicians. So I was writing like that, but then I was working with Stan Saltzman. Yeah, yeah. You know. So. I suppose the challenge for me was trying to trying to put those things together mm. and I didn't want to write a Stan Saltzman piece for Stan Saltzman to play with me of course you know but now now I, I suppose I kind of think I was a bit more I was a bit more willing to accept weak spots in in composing then well, that's the thing. I don't think it's a weak spot in the writing. I, no. And I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a weak spot because I lo- absolutely love this record. But it struck me listening to it, even when I was a kid, that at that moment in the music, and people people don't know it, they can go and listen to it. It's an amazing record called In the Meantime. Um, at that mo- at that point in the track, it's as if everything that you've built up, up till that point gets either forgotten or put to one side, deliberately abandoned, you know. Yeah. And then it comes back later. Um and that sort of feels, if that's a deliberate thing, then I get it. But if it's not the deliberate mm. thing, then I, I find it strange, you know. But and I'm not I'm actually. Really, I think I, th- I think know I know the answer to this. Right. Um, for me, on that on that record, those little bits after the main head, mm. the blowing, and then the bit which is actually the bridge of the tune, which but feels like an interlude because it's separated quite a long way for me for me it all works because i really like the coda i really like the d b g thing which was like a sort of i thought oh it sounds a bit like the stravinsky symphony of psalms play play us that bit quickly so Um, we know what we're talking about the the coda just the little yeah just the just the the right and left so it's that thing again The yeah. And because the cycle in the bass is a different length mm-hmm. to the melody, you get sort of different harmonizations all the time, but from basic things set up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, do you think it's meaningful to teach the blues for example without trying to understand what those sounds could have meant to the people creating them trying to understand because obviously mm. we can't understand um, in in that, in that kind of society you know around the beginning of the 20th century yeah. what does it mean to separate um, all that historical stuff and all the what we can kind of broadly describe as technical stuff about the music, how it works specifically, yeah. you know? Um, well, I think, I mean, for me, for me, a lot of the issues with this stuff start in school. Mm. So I think, I think a lot of the, for instance, the conservatoire courses in this country and the ones that I've taught on, they do teach some history but it's kind of it's it's like a specialist sort of side option thing almost as far as i can tell i mean i don't don't know if that's true Mm. but but it always felt to me like you know if somebody's if somebody's 18 or 19 and they haven't and they're playing the blues and they haven't looked into that yeah 
it's unlikely that they're going to be good enough at playing the blues to get into a conservatoire. That, 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 well, that was my that was my idealism. I think mm. you know back when I started teaching. Yeah. You know, I th I thought you there was a certain amount that that people assumed because because there was a lot of technical stuff to get through mm -hmm. and the reason that there's a lot of technical stuff to get through is because conservatoires are still run by a classical yeah. kind of mindset i suppose you could say and they're used to assessing things in a certain way they're used to teaching things imparting knowledge in a certain way and, and all of this stuff is slowly changing yeah. i realize that yeah um but It's, I think if you, if you try and do that at conservatoire to make up for what's been missed mm. in school age, um, you'd probably be a bit split down the middle with stuff, you know, it's like on the one hand, on the one hand you have, you, you need to know all this history and immerse yourself in the lives of these people and what led up to the lives of these people and on the other hand we're telling you that an E natural doesn't work and an E flat does but you may take two years to figure that out for yourself but mm -hmm. when you know that that's an E flat and not an E natural because of all that time you really know it yeah you're not told it and then say okay this is what you use for C minor yeah, you yeah. just use it and, and it's it doesn't go with any accompanying feeling so I think I, I think I think the higher education thing is dealing with a difficult situation that is given to it a, a bit. I would agree with that and I, I couldn't agree more that um, the way we're taught history in our schools, you know, from, from a young age is, is criminal. Um, really criminal yeah. but but and but I still I, I would also say that you know conservatoires could definitely do a lot more um to to make our awareness of why those sounds were created mm. um go go move in parallel with things about e naturals and, and e flats and I think that would make for a better situation all around you know when I was there I I never wrote about sociological things historical things and even when I was doing jazz it was like I looked at the music did transcriptions or looked at scores with a pencil mm. and it took me all week to do that yeah. you know and that, that was what I was good at and I was crap at history at school yeah and you know I, I mean to be honest I would find a history component difficult I mean, yeah. I think, it, you know, the awareness, there's a certain amount of awareness that, that is assumed when you get to college. And maybe that's, maybe that needs to be reevaluated. Well, I think that assumption is sort of misguided. Yeah, it could be. And it it's, could be. I mean, it's, it may not only be misguided, it might also be sort of deliberately, I'm not speaking about you, I'm speaking just totally generally deliberately um, blind let's say I mean the thing about the thing about schools about, about history in schools is just I, I, you know it's I can't understand how it's still the way it is and mm. that's definitely the, something, something that needs to be changed right now and that would definitely have a, an impact on you know we get all, all the way from that we get impact on playing jazz and how aware we are you know when we play that music, mm. um, it just seems so obvious to me that that something has to be done about that, and it's difficult to, like you said, correct all of that ignorance because you know that's the, part of the reason why <laughs> this country, many countries, but this country in particular, is so unbelievably ignorant about our, our history, and um, I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, well, we've we've that, we've got a pretty big reputation to lose haven't we from finding out about exactly, it exactly yeah and i'm sure that you know that would have an impact a positive impact on how we um made music actually uh, yeah yeah def definitely 
So, um, thanks, Liam. Thank you. Thanks it's for been, uh, talking to me. It's been nice to yeah. vent.